welcome. Welcome to the Sunday session. My name is Steve Judge. I'm the host of Football Network World's weekly webinars with football practitioners from around the world. Uh, this week I'm joined by Mikhail Brunel, Technical Academy Technical Director at La Havre FC, and Javid Farahani, who's a um, Cognition and Skills Acquisition Consultant at Fulham. Um, before I start chatting to them and they begin their presentations, um, I'll just uh, give you a quick overview of, uh, of the structure of this evening session. So as always on the Sunday session, we try and split it into a uh, discussion of two halves. And the first half will sort of evolve around the presentations that Mikhail and Javid are giving. Uh, with Mikhail up first, well, scanning, then Javid with the situational awareness, and then a bit of time for the pair and for you to sort of review and ask questions around the presentation. So again, it's a reminder that, yeah, to use the Q&A tab to ask the questions of the guys. And sort of the second half, we'll sort of specifically, we'll zoom down a little bit more into their work and when we sort of look at when they sort of coach, sort of the football intelligence in terms of which ages they can start and then how that progresses through the different uh, development phases, specifically then how they coach it, what are the training methods, the drills, how they test it. Um, and then we'll sort of, yeah, it should sort of overlap a little bit more into sort of the areas of gamification and video analysis and sort of look at those areas to see what value they bring uh, in the training of sort of perception, decision-making in, in young footballers. So that's all to come towards the end of today's discussion. Um, we'll start, uh, I'll sort of start with a quick hello to Javid. Javid, how are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Yes, yes, I'm very well. You're all set? Yep, thanks for having me. Okay, yeah, it's good to have you here. Um, I'll let you just relax for a few, few minutes. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll have Mikhail coming up first with his presentation. Mikhail, how are you? Hi, Stephen. How are you? I'm fine. Very happy to be with you and uh, and to speak uh, and to talk about uh, football and the training uh, training methodology. <laughs> We're gonna have a good okay. Yes, I think so. I think so. So I'm gonna hand the screen over to you. It's all yours for now. So if you sort of yeah, give your introduction and your presentation on your work at La Havre in terms of scanning. Okay, I'm just sharing my screen. Can you see? Yes. Perfect. So uh, yes, so um, when we discussed with uh, Steve, you know, the idea was to talk about perception and scanning. Um, again, uh, I'm gonna make a, a very quick presentation of, my, of the academy. But uh, what I would like today to, to share with, uh, with everybody is um, that in, I'm working a lot on this uh, uh, skill. And I, and I talk about the skill because I consider perception and scanning as a skill to be taught alongside technical and tactical skills. And of course, uh, I travel a lot and I go in many countries and in France in many clubs. And I, can, I promise you that scanning is something that of course we use every day with words, head up, uh, watch your shoulder, and, uh, okay? But what do we do every day to, to train this and to educate uh, our kids to develop the level of, of perception? So uh, this is my background, a very quick background. You know, I've been working at the Academy of Le Havre for uh, 16 years, okay? Because I'm gonna start my 16th uh, season uh, in July. Uh, I was lucky to, uh, I've been working at the Academy for 16 years and I was also lucky to work with a pro team uh, as assistant coach of uh, famous coaches who are now uh, training in, in, in different clubs. Okay, so uh, that's a very quick presentation. And of course, uh, Le Havre, because maybe uh, some of you don't know about Le Havre, Le Havre is a fam famous academy in France, okay, because uh, we are playing in League Two. Uh, we've been uh, bought by an American chairman uh, a couple of years ago. And as you can see, all the players we produce in our academy are now very famous, okay? Uh, Fernand Mendy is playing in Real Madrid. Benjamin Mendy is in Man City. 
Riyad Mahrez is in Man City. Uh, Las Diara was in Real Madrid, Arsenal, Chelsea. Uh, Paul Pogba uh, is in Man United. Dimitri Payet uh, in, uh, in Marseille and Stel Mandanda in Marseille in France. You know. So uh, just to give you an idea, we are the only club, only two clubs in France uh, who are, give, uh, are, are, are lucky to have three world champions, Le Havre and Lyon. Okay, because uh, uh, Benjamin Mendy, Mandanda, and uh, Pogba won the, the last World Cup, you know. And of course, Payet could have been in, in this team. And we also have the winner of the African Nations Cup, Riyad Mahrez. Okay, so we are, of course, very proud because we are a small club, a League Two club. But our academy is, uh, is quite famous in France. And I know that in England, uh, many Premier League clo clubs uh, uh, have a look at our players every weekend. You know? <laughs> so... Uh, the, ju just and to finish with the presentation, the performance rating of our academy, because we've got one specific uh, particularity, is that most of our players uh, start at the age of six and seven and become pro. So as you can see, all those players started in our academy at a very early age. This one, Yasser Laroussi, is now in Liverpool with Jürgen Klopp. You know, so uh, he started at the age of 10 in our academy. And as you could see, they, they grow. And this is for me the main, uh, the main objective, the main target of an academy is to bring a young player to the pro team and of course to bring him to success in football. Okay, so this is a quick presentation of my club. And I also would like, because this is the questions I, I, I raised in my, in my head, I would say, when uh, two or three years ago. And uh, I was studying the behaviors of uh, top players and of course, uh, I was lucky to, 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 to go to Clairefontaine and to share, to share ideas and to speak with many coaches and many top players. And I'm always, because I'm a coach, I'm not a scientist, but I'm always trying to improve my training methodology to make sure that I help my players to grow and, and succeed. Okay? And the questions I, I, raised in, I was raising was those ones, you know, can we educate perception? Okay, how can we measure the quality of perception? Uh, what is perception? Because maybe we don't have the same definition. And of course, is there a specific age to train it, train it and how we can train it? That's all the questions I, I, I was raising uh, a couple of years ago. And I've been working on this topic and now I'm gonna share with you today uh, some ideas. Um, first of all, what is perception? Okay, and how, how I define it, and maybe uh, Javad will, uh, will, uh, will give another definition and uh, we will discuss about this, but this is very important to... to... In Le Havre, we uh, first started from a vision, okay? So which qualities are um, important to succeed or you need to have to play at the highest level, okay? We consider that, of course, you have to be a good teammate, okay, because you play in a team, we consider that you have to be flexible because now in modern soccer, uh, you must be able to attack and defend, sometimes play in different positions, okay? You need to have a good technique. You have to, of course, to have physic a physical quality, okay? Because without physical qualities, you cannot succeed. But we consider, and this is, of course, we, all, we are all working on this every day in every club, in every academy. But we consider that what makes the difference between a normal player and a top player is that a top player is a fast thinker. And a fast thinker is not a, a fast player running fast. Is a fast thinker means reading fast, understanding fast, speed of execution, speed of decision, reaction, because sometimes you, you, you see an option and suddenly you have to change because the defender is coming and it's too late, so you have to change your, your idea. So a fast thinker is something that makes the difference between, for us, a normal player and a top player. And of course, today we are gonna focus on this point, okay? Because what does a fast thinker mean, okay? There is for me one, a very, very important sentence, which is uh, modern soccer starts in the head and finishes with the feet. That means now you can, of course, we all train to make a good pass, but everything first, and this is a new approach, I would say, because 10 or 15 years ago, we, we, we did not think that 
we, we were only, I would say, training the capacity to make a pass, a shoot, a, a head, heading, a, a move, how to move. But now we have to understand that to play at the highest level, you have to be clever, you have to be smart. And of course, uh, on the field, when you play soccer, 85% of the information you read on the field uh, comes from the sense of sight. The other 15% is communication from your teammates, is what you feel, if you feel the defender behind you, but most of the information are read by the eyes on, on, on the field. And of course, you read the situations you are in, you must be aware about the situations you are in, and of course, and that's what I was saying to, to Javad before, before starting the, the broadcast, the top players always have the answers in advance. That means they understand the game faster before the other ones. And of course, execution has to be considered as the result of a decision. And what, what I mean by execution, it's not only passing or controlling, it's also moving without the ball. When you decide to move in a free space, that's an execution to your reflection. Okay. So from this point, because it starts in the head and finishes with the feet, as a coach, I was thinking, what is game intelligence? Okay, because it's important to understand how game intelligence work and the process of game, you know, game intelligence. And I would sum it up very fast, very quickly, in four steps. For the, the, the first step is the capacity to perceive, to, 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 to scan, to read, to, to see what's going on around you. And step two is to understand the situation you are in. And of course, you have to make a decision. And of course, step four is the result of this decision. And in our sessions every day, we focus a lot on understanding, interpreting, interpreting the situation, making decisions, execution. But we rarely stimulate this part of perception which is the first step of game intelligence. What do I mean by this? I mean, if I am in the same situation as Mbappé, Mbappé will probably see more options than me. And of course, to make a decision, you have to see different options. So if your quality of perception is low, then you will not see many options. So you, you, you will not need to decide. And for me, and I, would and I will tell you this, I will show you this. In a team, there are different levels of scanning. There, is, there are different levels of techniques. There are diff different levels of scanning. Because the level of perception depends, of course, on the technical quality, depends on the pressure around the player, and depends on the capacity of the player to focus. In a team, I, I try to, 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 to use a slide to show you what I mean by a low level of perception, an average level of perception, and a high level of perception. A low level of perception is a player who mainly focuses his eyes on the ball and that does not spend a lot of time reading around him. So that means the ball is moving because in, in soccer, there is only one object on the field and the low level players are attracted by this object. And you, when you go to a, with, your, with very early young kids, they are all attracted by the ball because they want to have this object in the field. So a low level player, a low level of perception is a player who reads, who follows the ball with the eyes, but is not focusing, is not scanning around him to read the information. An average level of perception is a player who sees more options. And a high level of perception sees wider, further, sometimes behind him, and he knows his head, I would say, works like a radar. I will show you, because I try to show you, this is a low level of perception. In the same situation, the player receives the ball, he focuses his eyes on the ball, but he doesn't see what's going on around him. So he's not aware of his surroundings. He doesn't know if he has time, if he doesn't have time, if there's a defender coming. 
he will first focus on the ball and then read, but it's too late. At the highest level, it's too late. If you go to an average level of perception, an average level of perception, this is exactly the same situation, but this time the player probably has a better technique and of course is able to see more options, more players, more defenders, and his, his capacity to analyze is better because he can see and he can focus on other things than the ball. And then this is a high level of perception. He sees wider, he sees further, and there is something I could not make with the software. He also knows if the striker is coming behind him because he has a 360 degree vision around him. And he knows exactly if he has time, if he doesn't have time, if he, if he has to go, if he's far from the defender, if he's close to the defender, if the defender is coming from the right, if he's coming from the left, he knows everything. And my question was, how as a coach can I do, what shall I do every day with my kids to develop and to increase this level of perception? I will, I will show you, um, because this is something, uh, Arsene Wenger, okay, uh, because I, I was studying this topic and, and I could find this interview. And what I like in this interview is that he considers perception as a key criteria which separate the great players from the rest. That means they have a better understanding of the situation because of course, as I said again, they are not focusing on the ball, but they are focusing on all the details around them to make sure that when they receive the ball, they are in good positions. And this is for me what's uh, the most important is to help the kids not to focus on the move of the ball, but to focus on the information they have around them, free space, teammates, opponents, position of the body, how they are positioned on the, gr on the ground. And I will show you, what? sorry. And this is my, my last slide, okay. Perception is different if you are a striker, if you are a midfielder, if you are a defender, because perception is not only for the strikers or the midfielders, it's also for the defenders. And I'm going to show you one or two clips, videos, just to, just to show you, for instance, Messi, how he reads around him while the ball is moving. Look, the ball is in front of him, is permanently looking around him on the left, on the right, forward, backward, but he's the ball is moving, but he's not focusing on the ball. He knows where the ball is and he's reading between the lines to make sure that when the ball gets to him or when the ball gets into his area, when he receives the ball, he already has the answers in advance. So as you can see, the ball is on the left, he's looking on the right, he's turning his head on the right. His head works like a radar. He's constantly, permanently turning his head, reading around him to make sure that he's already anticipates what's going to happen when the ball gets to, the, to his area. And this is what I mean by scanning. I mean not to focus the, the, the eyes on the ball, but to focus on the information you have around you. And I will show you another video with Luis Suarez. This is a video I made for Clairefontaine a, a couple of years ago. And, oops, sorry. And look at Luis Suarez. 1v4, he decides to dribble and he decides to go alone and, and to dribble. This is a simple action and you can all say yes, but it's Luis Suarez, he's a top player and, and he can make it. I just remind you, I just remind you that he's playing against Atletico Madrid. He's not playing against a, 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 an amateur, an amateur, amateur player, you know. But look, look what he does before deciding. Look, he turns his head. The ball is next to him. He's not focusing his eyes on the ball, but he's focusing his eyes on what's going on around him. First.
The ball is coming to him. And he's still focusing a second time, raising his head a second time. He hasn't touched the ball. A low-level player would, pro would probably have gone to the ball and controlled it and then raised his head. The ball is in his feet. And he, raised, he raises his head a third time. So as you can see, the ball is next to him, but he's not focusing on the ball and the move of the ball, but he's focusing on the information he has around him. And because he knows that in this situation he's alone, he decides to go alone. And he relies on his, on his physical qualities, on his capacity to dribble. And then he decides, okay, but you can see that the decision making comes from his capacity not to focus on the ball, but to focus on the situation he is in. And then he relies on his capacity to dribble on his physical quality. And I will show you a last video for the defenders. I will show you Varane, because the defenders also have this capacity not to focus on the ball, but also to focus what's going on in the box, for instance. And look at Varane. Varane, the ball is on the right, is not looking at the ball, but he's turning his head to see which striker is coming into the box. A second time, he turns his head. The situation, he has to cover his full back, his left back, but he also has to read and to see which striker is coming into the box. Third time. So, of course, they concede the goal, but I'm not talking about the decision making. I'm just talking about his capacity not to focus his eyes on the main action, but to turn his head on the other side because he's close to, the, to his goal, he's into the box, and he has to cover his teammate, but he also, have, he also has to read around him which striker is coming into the box. And again, probably a normal defender would have focused his eye on the ball and forgets maybe the striker coming into the box. I will show you. Look how, look how he turns his head all the time, how he turns his head all the time to read the information. So this is what I mean by scanning. And, and we will talk a little bit uh, later on about this. But I think that to understand the situation you are in, you must be able not to focus on the ball, but to focus on the information you have around it. That means teammates, defenders, position of the ball, but where you are positioned on the field. And this is what I mean by scanning. Scanning, perception for me, is the capacity to scan and to read. Because turning the head without reading is not enough. You cannot only turn the head like this. You must turn the head, but you also must read the information. And this is what I mean by perception. And I will, of course, uh, in the second part after uh, Javad's uh, presentation, I will, of course, try as a coach, what can I add in my sessions every day to improve this capacity, not to focus on the ball, but to focus on the information around you, uh, around the player. Okay? This is it. Thanks, Mikhail. Um... I don't know whether Javid, whether you have uh, any initial thoughts on Mikhail's presentation before before you give your your side of things. Absolutely, thanks, Mikhail. That was very interesting to know about the way you organize the information. The only uh, point I wanted maybe to mention is the analogy come to my mind when it's come to tracking the ball is when you drive a car and you do barely try to even uh, look for the pedal pedals or uh, you know, where the brake is, where the gas pedal is, because you may want to be worried about them at the very earliest stage, but once you became automated in uh, driving a car, you even don't look at them. That's exactly the same scenario for football. So that's the basics of the learning of the uh, principle of the game, to not to even look at the ball, because they know where, where the ball is and where the ball is traveling to. So it's quite easy to anticipate for the uh, fantastic players in elite level, to understand where the ball is, where it's coming, where it's going to be, 
and uh, how to use that time to scan the environment. But there are more elements which can be uh, discussed. I'm, I'm going to share with you in terms of the situational awareness, in terms of uh, performance under pressure, and also the capacity. How much information can we really take in a short-term memory? Okay, I will uh, get up sharing my uh, my screen. Sorry. There we go. So yeah, Javid, it's uh, over to you. Sure. Let me. Yeah. This is now. Oh, let me actually make the. Sorry. Yeah. Perfect. Great, so uh, a quick background of my uh, journey so far in the game. I've done my uh, PhD in Applied Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London. In order to understand and being able to communicate football language, I, I did some of the courses of the FA and I completed my UEFA B coaching license. And also because media is a part of the game that you need to understand how the coaches use it to uh, continue the battle before the match and after the match. I became a journalist from 2013 in Premier League and UEFA to be able to go to the press conference and interviews the coaches to understand their tactical point of view uh, in the game. Perhaps I'm the most boring journalist in the room when it comes to uh, post-match uh, games because I don't really care about the red cards or events. I ask tactical questions and sometimes if you search YouTube and uh, Mourinho or Wenger or a couple of the uh, Premier League uh, managers, they became uh, upset by the level of the tactical details we may ask them. So a first definition of the, what is applied cognitive neuroscience in general to give a taste of what is my angle to the game is whenever we talk about memory, attention, decision making, learning, creativity or language, these are all go under umbrella of cognitive neuroscience. What I want to focus today on this session is how we process information and how we make decisions. So just one of those uh, potential uh, verticals. How we capture data, because data and measuring is the way to not to think in a biased way and being able to objectively understand what is going on in the world. We have four different uh, skills. One of them is cognitive assessments. Basically, we use the essence of the way human perception works and how we perceive information. We also can use actual games like chess or actual video games like football and uh, different video games available. We can use EEG and fMRI also to understand the way the brain is uh, working inside by measuring the, uh, acti uh, the electrical activity of the brain. These are the techniques we usually use to understand the capacity of the brain and also to understand how we process information. Now, the problem in football, in talent identification and in talent development, in my opinion, goes for two specific topics. One is perception, as we discussed so far, and the second one is decision making. And by decision making, I don't mean the execution. I don't mean the pass or amazing dribble or amazing uh, shot on target. Uh, I mean something basically purely about reading the game and making the right decisions. So to give you a sense of what does perception means in research world, I'll give you a simple example. If you look at this specific scenario, a team is attacking from left to right, and one of the player has the ball in one of the boxes, 13, 14, or 15, basically behind the opponent's box. If you ask 160 male Premier League Academy footballers, that they are the ones who are supposed to become an elite players in maybe a couple of years time. We ask them about what is the likelihood of you try to shot on target from those locations and you create a serious attacking scenario. And by serious attacking scenario, we basically mean if you can score a goal or you can create a very dangerous uh, scenario for your team. The answer was quite interesting. The players think the likelihood of scoring a goal from those positions on the pitch is 64%. But when you look at the actual data in the real world, when they tried it themselves, or when you try to look at the Premier League footage or Bundesliga footage, the real data is 7%. So they, even in the very earliest stage, they even don't know what is going on in the real world. 
This is how big is the gap about the simple assessment of odds. What is the possibility of scoring a goal from this location? They are purely on a different page on this specific topic. Second type is decision making. So we ask uh, the players to uh, answer 20 scenarios, five seconds each from real world scenarios. We ask three independent coaches, one from Ajax, one from US under 23 uh, national team, and one, one of the uh, FA tutors to give three options per scenario independently to say, this is my best attacking option, this is my second best attacking option, and third is the worst option. As an example, you can see the, where the ball is highlighted and the question is where the ball should go, number one, number two, or number three. I don't know why someone should choose number three when you can see already the left back and the, the midfielder is so close to intercept the ball, but there are players in the Premier League level who are supposed to go to the first team that make the wrong decisions. 54% is the number when you compare the coach opinion and the player opinion. So the assessment is not about even the outcome of the execution. When you ask them to read the scenario, they don't understand the principle of the game. They are not educated. They are not trained. They've been trained on the skills like dribbling, passing, shot on target, but they were not exposed to enough information about how to make the right decision to build a good attacking scenario. In an example with Arsene Wenger in uh, 2000, <coughs> excuse me, 16, in one of the games against Chelsea in the Stamford Bridge, I asked him in the press conference, what would happen if a cameraman and a reporter go to the pitch at minute 15, 13, and 60, and ask your players what you are going to do next? Do they have anything in mind already? Do they know what they want to do? Or they don't know? And the answer was quite shocking because he said, with their performance, it seems to me they don't have any idea of what they are supposed to do. So the game plan was lost. They were not being able to make the right decisions. So what is the solution for these two factors? The first important word is situational awareness. And by that specific word, I mean, Perception of environmental elements and events. Element means individual players. Event means unit and group of the players with respect to time or a space. To understand the meaning of those factors and of course, to being able to project the future status. This basically means there are three key elements for situational awareness. One is if the kid, if the player understand what is our game plan because you go to a game and you already practice three or four sessions before the game for a specific game plan do they remember the game plan are they interested in the game plan the second factor is can they read the scenario with two factors first a good perceptual skills in terms of assessing what is a possibility of a specific action secondly what is a right action for me in a specific uh, moment to make a decision the last part is anticipation, which basically means, can I predict where the ball is going to in two or three seconds? Can I predict where the player is going to be in two or three minutes, in, in two or three seconds? That's a, a specific a skill coming to the game plan and together they can build the actual execution. So there are three key elements to measure that situational awareness. The first one is cognitive capacity. Purely, it's about how much information does the brain can hold, basically, for the player. Is that two piece? Is that three piece? Is that seven piece? On the pitch, I, as a player, I am going to play with 21 other players. In most of the scenarios in the compact game we play these days, remove the goalkeepers, it's a matter of 19 other players. How many of them I can track? How many do I can remember? The second point is, when I make a scenario decisions, can I read the decision in a proper way? Can I understand the tactic in the specific scenario? And can I remember it again, which I call game intuition. Game intuition is basically the uh, accumulated knowledge from the very day one that you expose to information in tactical point of view to that specific game. If I start to learn, if I start to learn uh, playing football at age seven, how many games I've watched from age seven to age 14? 
and how many patterns I remember from those games. The last part is performance under pressure because you might be able to measure someone's cognitive capacity in numbers. You might be able to even measure the perceptual skills and decision-making skills, but when they go under time pressure, result pressure, mental fatigue or physical fatigue, they change. And there are enough studies to suggest if you are an elite player, you're gonna get benefit, you're gonna get buzz from those pressure factors, but no more players, Chuck, they cannot really perform. They stop performing. That's, that, that is where the big gap come from, from someone in a very elite side to someone as a sub-elite player. Give you some case study of what has been done in research wise. Uh, let's just look at the visual search strategy. Basically, the key elements, the essence of vision to identify the target on the screen, that was a study with Fulham. So the simple uh, question here was, can you see the red square which is flashing now on the screen? Do you see a red square? If it's present, press yes. And if it's not present, press no. So this is an example of a yes answer. You can see the red square in the middle of the screen. And this is the example of no, you cannot see any red square. There, there are other factors, but there is no red square. That was how simple was the task to identify if there is a red square on the screen. This is what happened when we compared from nine to 11 years old and to the 15 years old for three years. Top five performers were not all from uh, 14 and 15 years old. They've been from 11 and nine and 10. And when you look at from top 10, we have 30% of the player at age nine performing better than the most of the counterparts in the 12 and 13 years old. This basically tell us that the visual target, to, to, the ability to identify the visual target is not determined by age. The visual capacity is different and you can simply measure it by a simple cognitive assessment. The second case today is about, can you train decision-making? Can you train perceptual skills? And can you use it for talent identification in football? In uh, partnership with these uh, amazing uh, Premier League clubs, Watford, Palace, Fulham, West Ham, and Brentford, we ran a study using ARTT from NASA. So in the science, the way it works is you try to understand what has been working in different domains and can it be transferred to the real world of your own game. We look at the NASA performance back in 1993, many, many years ago. They increased the speed of simulators to force the brain of the pilots to make the decisions faster. That's called ARTT, above real time training. The same study happened in the US Army and US Air Force. They used the same exact same method four years later, back in 1997. And since then, no one tried to use this method in elite sports. We tried it with video-based training. We increased the speed of the video and we forced the players to make the decisions as soon as possible. Then we gave them feedback based on the club philosophy on the tablet. Interesting enough, we used four uh, different type of dose for training, one day a week, two day a week, three, uh, five days a week, or a random basis and we could see that they can improve their decision making for a short period of time in all four groups. So there is a method for enhancement of decision making skills using a bar real time, but it has a limit. It doesn't transfer to long term. You have to use it on a regular basis. The second point which was more interesting was the way people respond to those questions. So, on average, a normal player, it takes five seconds for them to make a decision on a video-based task to say, this is the best attacking option. When you train them, they became faster and they make a decision by two seconds. There was a player out of our uh, sample that he started his performance at 1.3 seconds. So his pre-test was faster than the post-test of the rest of the team. And after training, he was able to make decisions on only 700 milliseconds, less than a second. So basically in science wise, you cannot use this player in scientific report because he's an outlier. So we tried to remove him from the sample, but the reality was he was the best player 
of that sample and now he's playing for England under 23. And he didn't make decisions by chance. His accuracy goes up from 61% before training to 72% after training. Again, this effect of training remained only for a couple of weeks because once we test these individuals after eight weeks of no training, they almost forgot everything. They need to keep training on a regular basis. The result was presented to brain, uh, progress in brain research and it was uh, validated by co cognitive neuroscientists. And then it was transferred to England rugby. That was very interesting to know that same principle come to the different team sports like football, rugby, basketball, and handball. When you want to train situational awareness using the knowledge of the coach and a channel like video uh, based training in above real time training. And my final uh, word is, unless you, do, you measure the capacity, it's very difficult to improve it. The first step is to measure the capacity and then you can improve it. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks for that, Javid. Um, see, Mikhail is uh, sitting back there relaxing and having taken that all in. Um, so what about your initial impressions are of Javid's presentations and see if you have any questions for Javid on, on that. Yeah, I, I will, um, I would say, uh, and, and this is the, I would say the main problem I have now because uh, I'm um, thinking as a coach and, tr and the problem is, it's difficult for me now to measure, um, to measure the capacity of the player to, to read the information because it happened in the brain. And of course, uh, as a coach, I haven't got the machines. So there are machines existing, you know, football note and everything. And we were discussing about this with Javad. But, but again, this is the transfer between the field and, and, and the machine is, is not football. You know, I mean, the, the transfer is very weak, you know. And uh, Javad said that if you cannot measure, you cannot improve it. I would say at the moment in the half, I cannot measure it. I try to think about things, but at the moment it's, compli it's complicated to, to measure. But I think that you can try, because I consider again, uh, perception as a way to not to focus on the ball. I consider that we can educate and we can train our kids every day just by adding simple tools uh, to uh, help them not to focus on the move of the ball, but to focus on the information they have around them. Because again, uh, in an academy, we have young players. When you are very young, you are mainly attracted by the ball and by the ball, which is the main object, I would say, on the field. Because when you play soccer, this is the, the football, this is the the root of football, huh? there are two goals, 22 players, and one object, which is the ball. And when you are very young, you are attracted by the ball. And of course, when you grow, you are educated in a system of play, you are educated in a, in a position, you are educating how to make a pass, how to improve your technique. But you can see that the top players, as I showed you with Luis Suarez and with uh, Messi, but I could have shown you many other videos, you can see that those players, they have something more and they can read the information around them. And this is, oh, I agree with Java when he, when, when, he speak, when, he, when he uses the word situation awareness. Situation awareness, in fact, is the result of scanning. You scan, you read, because you are not focusing on the ball. And if you focus on the ball, if you only focus, uh, focus on the ball, then you forget all the information or you have a minimum, uh, a very minimum number of, of information around you. So when you receive the ball, you are surprised. You didn't see the defender. You didn't see that, that you, you, you could uh, move forward. Or, so, so you make mistakes. And I, I really consider that, of course, no, we are not, as a coach, we mainly, mainly try to, to develop this capacity to make decisions, to read, this, the, read the situation you are in. But perception is something that I do not see much in training sessions, 
in professional academies or I would say in a general way in uh, training sessions in, in a general way. You know? And I believe that of course now I cannot measure the improvement and I cannot measure uh, the level of perception, but I consider that uh, like for the technique, if I, if I stimulate perception every day, and I will show you some tools, I use very, very simple tools. If I stimulate uh, the capacity of the player to scan and not to focus on the ball, then he will develop his uh, level of perception. So his, his capacity to read and understand the situation is it. So this is, I would say, uh, I believe that we can improve it. I think, uh, yeah, there's certainly a lot of crossover between between the two presentations. I would say first with you, Mikhail, in terms of when you're when you're looking at, at scanning, is it scanning is when you're coaching it, you're introducing it into your sessions, is it something that you look at in isolation when you're coaching it, or are you coaching it as part of as as Javid would say with the situational awareness? So there's this awareness of what else is going on it's not just well first i'm coaching players just to play with their heads up and then progress it um i would say both actually i work on the individual i mean to improve his capacity to read around him but then i i also link this uh, development of perception with the game model because when you give the game model, and, and Javad said this, you, you, you have the player to identify the, 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 the situations, and then you have to make decisions. And when they are young, it's important to, to not to tell them what to do, but to tell them what to read and where to read. And for instance, I, I, I will give you an idea, an example. Uh, if you're a center back, uh, you must be able to read what's going on between the lines. You also must be, so this is, I would say, uh, an average cue, okay, to read what's going on between the lines. You must be able to read what's going on on the opposite side of the field because, you, because playing a long ball with the winger, for instance, is an option. And you must also be able to have a short option, which is, I'm alone, I have three space, I move forward, I dribble, and then I make a pass. So the idea, again, is to create the game model, and this is the link between the individual development and the player development within a team, is to, to, to give them, I would say, a short option, an average option, and a long option, and then, of course, he reads and he has to decide. So, this is, I would say, as a coach, because you know that when you talk about game model, it's giving the players some codes to understand each other, okay? To, 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 to make sure that everybody, everybody understands. And of course, the code is not, you have to do this. It's, you have to read this short option, this average option, this long option, and then you decide. You decide, and then we analyze it with the video, and we speak about it. If you're a striker, you must be able to know if you want to receive the ball on your right foot or if you want to receive it in the space. And again, the player, you, you tell, look, there are two options. You can receive the ball in the foot or you can receive, you can receive the ball in the space, running back uh, in the back of the, of the back four. And then you make a decision. Maybe in this situation, running uh, in the depth was not the, good, the best option because he was offside. So you see, so there is the, both this capacity to develop the player as an individual player being able to read and this capacity to use this player within a team game model. What I call fundamental, you know, you've got team fundamentals and you've got uh, individual fundamentals, okay? Team fundamentals is what you expect your player within a team and individual fundamental is what you expect your player to do uh, alone as an individual. And of course, according to his position because he's, he's in a team, of course. Because perception is different if you're a, a, a center back, 
if you're a striker or midfielder, of course, the perception is not the same. Huh? When you are a midfielder, you have to read 360 degrees around you. When you're a center back, I mean, you have to read what's going on in front of you, of course, because the, the game is in front of you. And when you're a striker, you must be aware of what's going on behind you because you are always with the defender behind you. So the level of perception is, of course, different. So we'll get into the, uh, the uh, position specifics. Um, in a moment, I'm sort of with Javid. Um, obviously, part of the research you showed there in sort of working with the younger age groups. I mean, in terms of some of the aspects that Mikhail brought up there, I mean, what sort of age groups can you start working with this? I mean, you sure. seem to be suggesting as young as nine with your research, though I know it, the Harvard Mikhail mentioned that they have players as young as seven. Um, I don't know how you're aware of seven is a, a good age to start with that or as well or nine is um, as nine was the point that we start as a kind of in, in this in the in the youth because the club only have nine as a registered above so they have mm -hmm. pre-academy but they are not registered to the club in terms of professional football that's kind of you know FIFA rule uh, in terms of training uh, scanning and in terms of tactical understanding uh, I don't think it's possible to teach from seven to uh, maybe even 13 and 14 for a simple reason, working memory capacity. This part of the brain is where we hold the information when we have a short-term information. So after this uh, uh, webinar, once one of the audience closed the app, the, to remember that Javid was wearing this shirt or he had this watch or uh, Steve was uh, sitting in a room with a kind of uh, great sofa on the back or this floor was here or the piece of information they can remember from that after uh, webinar excluding the content which is the main focus of the uh, you know uh, webinar the problem is we know we now know with the research we have done with these people that from age 9 to age even 13 and 14 the capacity of information they can hold in their mind is maximum two or three. And three even is an, and it's not gonna be seven or eight in uh, adult age, it's gonna be four or five in the best, best case scenario. Give you an example, I had a player that I was told on a couple of uh, occasions from the coach point of view that he is very rude, he doesn't listen to me. I keep telling him do this and he doesn't do it on the pitch. And I observed the kid and I didn't really notice any rude behavior. So I tested the kid uh, brain capacity and his working memory was not developed yet. He was 11 years old, but he was equal to a nine years old or even eight years old. So basically he forgot what he was being told to do. So now think about on a, on a pitch that you're asking the kid to remember the position of three or four of his own teammates and three and four of uh, the opponent. That's a minimum amount of information you're asking them to do. It's not, it's not gonna be possible. They don't remember, that's a problem. The brain development goes uh, onward until age 14, 15. They start to go to the teenage process and then it even continues to age 25. The teenage brain can be even 25. That's quite uh, a bad news for some of the coaches, but this is a reality. And if you scan their brains, you're gonna scared because the brain is totally different way of thinking. And you can even feel it from their behavior on the social media. They don't really care about how the other people think about them, although they are supposed to know that I am, I'm going to be well perceived if I do this specific behavior. So this is the importance of knowing the age of how much information you can hold. The second part is how much information can we really hold? Can we remember from the objecting and from tracking objects? Let's just play a simple game because I mentioned about uh, our capacity that's going to give you a good taste. So if I remember, if I just read these um, numbers to you and then we uh, stop the screen, let's see how many of them we can remember. 1, 45, 12, 4, 6, 8, 11, 78, 10, 6, 45, 90, 4, 3, 61. I repeat it again. 1, 45, 12, 4, 6, 8, 11, 
78, 10, 6, 45, 90, 4, 3, 61. I start with you, Steve. Just go and tell me the numbers. Um, let's see, what do you have? One, one, four, forty-five, twelve. Okay. Six, three, eight, eleven. And yeah, then beyond that, yeah, my mind was. Uh, and now, to you, Michael, you tell me the the, the numbers. Uh, I think I'm the same as Steve. One forty-five, uh, six eight. Uh, and I forgot. I forgot the other ones. Okay. So I they are seventy-five. I, I mean, in the right order. Yeah. Okay. So in the right order. Let's see what was your numbers, and let's just compare them with what we just actually said. So as Steve said one, four. 45, 12, 6, 8, 3, and 11. And Michael said 1, 45, 6, 8. What was the correct answer? There was no number 3 in the earlier stage, but you remember it from the late of the numbers. And on Michael's side, he basically forgot 12, 4, and he jumped to the 6. This is the limit of our brain. Now, let's go to even make it more complex. This is an example of a football pitch scenario. Six players against six players. What I want to do is to look at this scenario for, let's say, let me just actually remove the video because it may prevent us. So, what I want you to do is to look at this picture for five seconds, for 10 seconds, which is not the equal time you have on the pitch. On the pitch, you just scan for two or three seconds at the maximum, but I just focus for now. And then tell me which number goes where. Shall we start with Steve? <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to begin. I was listening to the instructions and not- Okay, let it start again. Don't worry, we can repeat it. This is yeah. the picture. Just look at the picture for how long you want. Okay, now let's go to this one. Tell me where, what, where do you want to put any number? Don't even be, worry about the number. If you just, just can distinguish color. Uh, on the center left, I think there's red, one, three. Here? Uh, more, no, more in the center left. There's a, there's a grouping of four in the center left. Okay. More yet towards the middle. Four here, okay. One, no. One, one, three, not two. One, three, one, blue, three, and a red five. One, three, one, uh, red five, okay. Somewhere here, okay. Uh, the number three, not the number one. And yeah, the, the, the blue three is next to the red three. The blue three is next, okay. And the red five is where the, the blue one is. Okay. Fine. The rest. Uh, then mirroring that on the left there was, uh, I think, uh, blue two four six. Blue two four six. Okay. And with a red four. Mm -hmm. It's over here. Uh, yes. And then the remaining the remaining numbers were in the in the corners. Okay, so something here and here. Yeah. Right? So yeah. this was the actual scenario. Blue one and six on here, and you can see you swap them with reds, as you can see already. Do you see them? Two and six red, one and six. Mm -hmm. And you can see the pattern, how it changed. So you can't remember, even if you try hard, you can't remember. Let's do it with Mikael. Mikael, this is your scenario. This is my scenario? Yeah. Uh, look at it for 10 seconds, if that's convenient. Okay, now tell me 
what do you want to put where? Red. Okay. 612 from uh, above Six, to... One, two, okay. From above to, to higher. Yeah. Okay. Six higher on the right. Okay. Uh, on the right, yes. Okay, and two below one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I forgot. Uh, five, I would say five, three, four. Okay, where are they going? In the middle, five, three. And five, four, four on the, the top, uh, the bottom right hand corner. Here? Yeah. Okay. And five, three in the middle, five above three. Five above three, something like this. And then blue, I would say one, five, three. One, five. One between six and five, a bit higher. Between six and five, here? Five, a bit higher. Here? Uh, uh, higher. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, five, three, uh, below one, five below one, and three below three, uh, below five. Sorry, five below one yeah. and this, like, like this. Yeah? yeah, and the other ones I don't remember. You don't remember these three, right? Yeah. Okay, so that was the actual scenario. This is what you remember. So as you see, again, on your case, that was the actual scenario. It was a blue one and you remember it red which is fine. Then you understand this pattern, basically, and you replicate it here. And there is nothing in the middle, but you see two of them in the middle. Yes. This is why we cannot hold information. Yeah. That's the problem. So even if you try to teach me how to see more information around me, I cannot remember them. And we had 10 seconds. We had more than a couple of seconds that we have on the pitch. And I'm not worried about the ball be, uh, you know, in front of my foot. And I'm not worried about the uh, spectators around me in the stadium. So the capacity is limited. And the second more important point is when you go to the game, you have a game plan, you have a position, you know where you're going to play, unless you, you're below age 13 and 12. Of course, we don't teach and we don't expect the kids to play four, two, three, one in a complex manner when it's when they're nine or 10 years old. But beyond age 14, we expect them to understand position. We expect them to understand how to the recovery run to the specific position they've been supposed to be. We expect them to be able to support the press when the ball is coming to a specific location. So there are two elements to consider. Elements one is they read the postural cues based on the close distance. That's all they can do really in terms of reading the scenario. Second point is they remember what they've been told from themselves and from the opponent. Because most of the time in the Premier League level, in the Bundesliga level, in French leagues, they already watched the opponent's games in the past. So they try to extract some patterns of the play from the opposition. They need to be able to remember those uh, patterns and they can be tested at how much they can really remember. Even after a couple of sessions of a training, Imagine you have a game on Sunday and you'd practice, I don't know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can simply ask them in a different way from direct question in a one-to-one -one session or even from a simple test on a mobile app to remember what was the principle you tried to focus on the session one. For example, think about you wanted to teach your players, we're gonna play against a very strong team. We don't have that much chance of keeping the ball. So we're gonna sit back, we're gonna defend deep, and we're gonna counterattack in this specific scenario. How much they can really remember about the objectives of the game and don't get confused by the real scenario when they are facing it. Um, yeah, um, it's something we could draw this back. We seem, seem to have gotten into a conversation here. It's very much about senior players. Um, we seem to be getting more questions coming through it, sort of very much at the beginning of sort of developing from nine-year-olds. Nine year um, I think you've done a good job there, Javid, that in terms of the tactical appreciation, 
it's not going to happen. And it's even very difficult to do, even with the senior pro players. Sure. Now with Mikhail, um, in terms of the scanning, are you able yeah. to, at nine-year-olds, pull yeah. that apart? And so that players are able, you know, what drills are you doing that enables players that they can receive the ball with their heads up and they're looking and, okay, you're not knowing what the, what's going on in their heads, but you're having an impression of, at least you can see that, they're now playing with their heads up and the, the, yeah. you know, the focus is not on the ball. Yeah, two, two, two important points uh, before showing you uh, some drills or, or what I do every day with my kids. Huh? The first thing is um, in, foot, in football, you know, the ball is moving and the, the teammates and opponents are moving all the time. You know, so scanning is a way to um, Tracking. constantly, I would say, permanently uh, readjust, I would say, the situation you are in. Because you know that you are in a situation, and, and Javid exercise is good, because I, I do agree with the point that we cannot read many information. Because, um, and that's why in, in, in the game model, we never go further than three options. Because if you, if you give more options, that it's impossible for them to read. So uh, we try to, to, to select, I would say, the best options according to the position, the, posi the position they are playing in, and then they have to make the choice between, according to the situation, between one, two, and three, or one and two, because if you give seven, six, seven options, that is too many, and they will, of course, uh, have problems to select. So that's the first point. And the, the second point is, again, scanning is necessary because Javad showed uh, the exercise, which I find interesting, but this is memory. And in football, the ball is moving, the players are moving, the teammates are moving. And each time you, you could see Messi, Messi is, Messi is constantly turning his head because uh, he's, he's not trying to remember the situation. He's just trying to read what's going on behind, behind him and how things change according to the move of the ball. And then when he receives the ball, maybe the last information he read will help him to make the right decision. So you could see in the video that he turned his head, he's turning his head 12 times on the left, on the right, backward, forward. But maybe when he will receive the ball, the last, the last look or the last um, scan he will do will help him to make the right decision. So the, as you could see, that's why I was saying before that perception is different when you are in a possession phase, when you are in a, in a finishing phase, because the pressure is different, okay? But I think that scanning helps the player to, um, to readjust according to the situation. And I will show you some, some uh, drills. I will share my screen. Because as I said, you know, um, it's coming, yes. As I said, you know, um, I consider perception as a skill, like a technical skill or a tactical skill, and that it has to be trained every day during our session to stimulate, I would say, uh, the capacity of the player to, to, to read the information. And of course, I will show you very, 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 very simple exercises and very, very simple games. Uh, because in the interview given by uh, Arsene Wenger, he says a very important thing which uh, struck me when I listened to this interview. He said, please, as a coach, do not kill perception. And in fact, what you see every day in clubs, with young players or older players, is you ask them to focus on the ball and not to focus on the surroundings. And my, 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 my objective, my, my work with the kids uh, in Le Havre is to add tools, and I say tools. It's not a specific exercise, it's not a specific game, it's to add tools to stimulate the perception and to make sure that the, the boy or the girl will not focus his eye on the ball because when you play a technical exercise, when you make a technical exercise, the boy will repeat the technical skill, but will mainly focus, his brain will mainly focus on the ball. 
And I want him to carry out this technical skill, but without only focusing on the ball. And I will show you some drills, very easy ones. I have no machine. I, have a, I haven't got a one million machine or one million dollar machine or something. But the idea, as I said, is to stimulate as much as, as possible, you know, the capacity of the player to focus on, on his surroundings. And of course, soccer awareness is scanning, turning the head and reading. And of course, scanning is not to focus on the move of the ball, but on the cues around you, around him. And of course, as a coach, what can I add in my training sessions to stimulate this capacity of perception? Of course, this capacity of a player to scan around him seems to be natural because sometimes they do it naturally. I don't know if uh, Luis Suarez was educated, maybe he was born with this, with this I would say, this, uh, this skill. But as a coach, I have top players in my academy. What can I do to maybe to help the other ones who are not born with it? What can I, what can I do to stimulate this? And I will show you so, some, some tools. First, there are different kinds of perception. Okay, uh, just, just to, to, to show you one or two things. Okay, so the head is working like a radar. The ball is in front of you and you must, so you see the ball, you know where the ball is and you must be able, it's what I call perception in the back. Means you must be able to know what's going on behind you. And the same on the opposite side, the ball is on the right and you must be able to turn your head on the opposite side to know what's going on on the opposite side because it helps you to open your vision, I would say. I will show you some tools. The first one is a very easy one. This is a possession game. But what I do when I organize the possession games, I can, organize, I can focus a sequence on possession. But then, as you can see, I use beeps in the hand or beeps with different colors. And in, an, in, a, in the second sequence, I mix the colors just to stimulate, to stimulate, you know, perception. So I can organize or prepare a, a possession game and have different sequences in which I will work on perception, on, on, on possession, which is blue v1 in each, in each area, 1v1. The blues possession, the possession sequence will be blue play against red. And they have to possess the ball and move in their area according to their opponent, according to the ball, according to, um, but they are, they are 1v1 in each area. And then in the second sequence, if I want to make this sequence uh, focusing on perception, it's not blue v red, but it's yellow pennies in the hand. They are holding a pennies in the hand against no pennies in the hand. So that means this red one with the with the yellow with the yellow bib in the, in the with the yellow pin in the hand is playing with this blue one. This blue or red one is playing with this blue one, and we mix the colors. So as you can see, we make the colors with different signs, with different colors, to make sure that we stimulate in a possession game this capacity to read the information. So this is the, the first level of stimulation, I would say. Now I will show you another drill. And of course, I can send them to you, Steve, if you want to share them with, uh, with, your, with the audience. It's not a problem. Look at this. Uh, this is a game situation. Look, sorry, it's Witzel in Dortmund. Just the ball is on the left, and he must be aware of what's going on on the right. Look, the player. You will see, look, the ball is in the air, and he's not focusing his eyes on the ball but he's already turning his head on the right to know what's going on on the other side. Again, if you do a technical exercise, what will you do? The player will receive, A will give to B, B will give to C, okay? Very simple one. But the problem is, if you do not add, and I will show you a tool I, I do with my kids, what happens? The boy will look at the ball, will control the ball, always looking at the ball, and then raise his head and see on the other side and look, at, look on the other side. 
here you can see that Vitson, the ball is coming from A to B, but is already turning his head on the other side to make sure that there is nobody and he's, he already has, in, I would say, he already knows in advance if he has time to control, if he doesn't have time to control, if there is a teammate, how far he is, because he is able not to focus his eyes on the ball, but to focus on the other side. So I will show you what I do with my kids because this is, sorry. So the ball is on the right, perception on the opposite side. Just to show you some tools I, I, I do every day in my technical exercises, okay? So again, I could have a technical exercise, but I had a tool and those, this tool is with the fingers. He's receiving a ball from this guy. There is another guy here. And on the opposite side, they are showing a numbers with their, with their fingers and he has to say the number before receiving the ball. Okay, because I want him to focus on the other side and look, and he has to say the number. And he turned his head because I want him not to focus his eyes on the ball, but to focus on the other side. And as you can see, they are showing you their fingers a number. This is a, tech, a very simple technical exercise again, but the tool is the fingers. And sometimes when I want to, to have it more difficult, I, have, I ask them to, to add the right hand to the left hand. So the level of perception or the level of reading information is different. I will show you another tool. Uh, hold on, can you just uh, jump in there, Mikhail, because we're uh, kind of very quickly running out of time. Um, you know, I just want to jump in with one or two of the, uh, the questions we've been, we've been getting. Okay. Um, so there's one here, Marcus Di Bernardo, um, sort of touches on some of the things that you've just been speaking about um, in terms of player player essential in terms of the cues essential cues and non-essential cues um i think you've sort of answered the next part of him so would game-based soccer trainings with real cues be uh, the best learning environments to create um where each player makes maximum numbers of decisions in the session uh and second to that is from a scanning perspective would playing with goggles that cut out 40 percent of peripheral vision help scanning and that it would force players to scan more because the information they would get is less. Um, so almost yeah, sort of wearing like blinkers so they have to turn their head more is yes does I that mean, translate? Actually when uh, when you look at Xavi for instance he has 360 degrees vision you know He's always turning his head, and you, you, you could see Messi, you know, he, he's turning his head on the left, on the right, backward, forward, uh, because he has a 360 degree vision. The problem is, again, with a kid, with a young one, because he focuses his eyes on the ball, he's not focusing, I mean, his vision is very, uh, is very um, narrow, you know. And the idea here uh, with those drills and exercises, again, and I'm showing you very simple ones, not, not to understand the, the drill, but to show you that how we can open the peripheral, I would say, vision of the player. Look, the player here, the player here, look, he's, he's already turning his head, you know, because you know that he has to read what's going on on the other side. If you make a simple exercise, the player would probably focus his eyes here on the ball. So he would, he would repeat the technical skill, which is controlling and passing, but he would not turn his head. And this is, for me, the main target of this work of perception. It's to tell the player, please do not focus on the ball, but open your vision to make sure that you have here a 180 degree vision. And then of course, when you have this vision, because you, the, I would say the more you see, the more uh, decision maybe you have to take, but, but, but then because you, have, you see more options or because you see that you have time or you don't have time, then you have to react according to the situation. Because often a player, and, and Javid said this, you know, the player is more in reaction. He reacts according to the situation. Sometimes he doesn't know what he's gonna do, but he reacts according to the situation because maybe here, if he received the ball and this one is coming to defend, 
he will probably not be able to, to, to control because he will react according to the situation. And I, I, I just reminded you that sometimes, and you could see, I, I will show you a video here, just to um, show you. Hold on, I just wanted to uh, bring Javid in on a point, if, uh, if you don't there mind. There is a problem here, yes. Uh, so thanks for uh, the comments. There is a problem here. We are switching the focus from the ball to a specific already known target. You're right. You're for right. that reason, we basically change the uh, object to track, but in real game, we can't really rely on that method, unfortunately. It's a very interesting method to help players unlearn focusing on the ball, but it doesn't teach them where to leak. That's true. You're right, Javid. Uh, the problem is now, we, as a coach, we don't do anything. Oh, of course. So, so the player, the problem is now, you, you're right, the, the, we are tracking somewhere else and they already know what to track. But, but at the moment, when you, when you make a technical exercise, you ask them to repeat passes and control and passes, for instance, but you know that they will follow the ball with the eyes and they are only tracking the ball. And I, what I try to do here, and we could imagine maybe the same drill with maybe two or different, two or three targets or two or three different options, but is, is again to tell them, look, look somewhere else. Do not look where the ball is. You I must have a suggestion. The purpose, of the, the purpose of the scanning to understand where is each player and to be able to connect the dots basically as a plan of my team and the opponent team. Maybe as a one-off training method, and it's just an experiment, a very uh, raw idea, but maybe what you can do is to give each player a piece of pen and paper and freeze in the middle of the sum of the session. So after five or six uh, pass, for example, ask them to immediately uh, draw where each player is and understand how much they basically remember about those uh, players. Because they may see the number, but the number doesn't translate the position of the player. No. This, this, this is what we could just say that this is bringing in, yeah, where we was gonna talk about um, progressing the coaching of this skill. So obviously you're, it's the examples that Mikhail is showing us there is sort of first to learn that behavior of first turning the head and which can work at the very younger age groups. But then as Javid is then is introducing, then, then you're looking at memories and pattern recognition. Yes. When does that then, yeah. When is that then you're able to bring those sort of exercises in, into the, uh, into the drills you give at your players? What sort of age groups would that would start to work? Well, one point, Steve, uh, going to this, I think what I'm showing here is something that you can do with the very young kids. Okay, this is what you can do with very young kids and what you can do with older kids as a routine. Okay, but then the step when, you, when they get 14, 15 and, and, and over is, and I agree, you add the tactical part of the game, which means uh, what do you remember? What did you see? And this is what we do as a coach in the questioning methodology. You know, when you stop a game sometimes and say, oh, no, stop. What did you see? Why did you, why did you make this choice? Where, where were the defender? And this is what you do as a coach in questioning the player why uh, he made this choice and what he saw and what he didn't see. And uh, this is what you can do. I would say first step with very young ones, uh, try to read somewhere else. And then when they get 14, 15, try to add what Javid is saying means the, the memory of the game and, and, and the understanding of the game. Because of course, when they are nine, they do not understand the game. I mean, they are learning the game. Javid, with that, I mean, you sort of, yeah, that, would you see that as being the right sort of age groups? Um, we'll say that first. Mikel, I don't know if you can uh, unshare the screen. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, Javid, um, yeah, in terms of one, let's say with that sort of progression in those age groups, what sort of ages do you think, yeah, to start introducing that pattern recognition and then to bring it on to a question from Gary Falzon. Um, sort of yeah working at the grassroots level obviously you can again use some of the techniques that that uh Mikel has sort of introduced with just simple drills on the training ground but are there are there any apps are we sort of then getting into the areas of sort of gamification and using video or or little games like you showed before 
do those help? Is, is there going to be any transfer and, and what sort of age groups, again, would you start using those for them to have any effect? Sure. So in terms of the age to start learning patterns, I would say nothing, be, nothing before uh, 12. I would say 12, 13, 14 is going to be a reasonable uh, age because they're going to play 11 and 11 uh, maybe by age 14. In terms of apps and technology, uh, currently what the current protocol with Premier League is to uh, get the kids to, to watch their own video and label it. So basically they know how many pass they made in a game, how many uh, dribble they made and make a kind of statics, uh, visual, uh, statics report for themselves. Uh, that would be watching more and more of the game from different source of the game, from Bundesliga to uh, Madrid and you know, La Liga and to the uh, UK one, will help them to be exposed to the different type of the game. That would be the important point, I would say, which is going to be video-based training, basically. I mean, on, on that, I suppose uh, so we sort of make this kind of like the last question. Um, sort of the, the point that both of you made almost from the beginning is, is yeah, how do we measure what we're doing? How, how do you test it? Um, we'll start with Mikel. Um, is there anything you're sort of hearing? You're moving towards something that sort of you're able to see at least test or see progression in players in what you're trying to teach them? I, I'm, working, um, I'm working with a, a university, a local university here. And we are, um, of course, we are thinking about the tests. But uh, uh, again, I don't know if there's going to be, a, is, if it's going to be the right test to do, but we are thinking about the test. Because the idea, I, I, I'm fully convinced that, uh, I, I promise you that I do this with my kids every day. I add the tools in technical exercises, in games. And I can see that, honestly, they are improving. When I say what, what they are doing, I can feel that the behavior is changing all along the season. I have some players arriving at the beginning of the season. They do not scan. They are just focusing on the ball. And I can see that because they become aware of this, because they, are, they understand that they have to look at somewhere else and not to focus on the ball, I can see that they try to change their behavior. The problem is now, it's complicated for me to measure this, or except by the fact that I know my players and except by the fact that I can show them on the video. I can show them, look, in this situation, you didn't see that the defender is coming. Or in this situation at the beginning of the season, you were not turning their head, now you are turning their head. So I'm working with a, a local university here to measure this with video. And with the test we are going to make on on uh, on uh, on the field, and I'm also working, and I can show you this with a sports psychologist uh, in uh, in uh, in Le Havre. Okay, he's a specialist in Formula One, and the same. It's a bit like Javid. It's not it's not football. It's something that we do uh, that we do uh, before. Okay before the, um, the, 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 the sessions or, or, or after the sessions and they have a kind of homework to do to improve and to measure with uh, a timer. And I would just show you an example just for you to understand. It's a bit like Javid, like in the same, in the same idea. It's not on the field. It, this time it's done before or after the session. But I will show you what he does with the kids. And that's what, we, that's what we were doing, you know, during the COVID period. Because, of course, you know that during the COVID period, we could not train. So they were, they were asked, you know, to read numbers and to do something with their hands and with their foot, you know. I will just show you. So as you can see, I can, I can send you, if you're interested, I can send you the document. They have to read from left to right and right to left and left to right and right to left. They've got one, two, three, four, and each time they read a number, they have to touch with the hand or with the foot. It depends on the, on the rule you give them. They have to touch the, the, the number. If they are reading a one, they have to touch with the right hand or with the left hand or, uh, or so, uh, and look. So again, this is the idea to read with the eyes some, 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 something and to do something with your foot or with your arms, you know, 
So it means being able to do, uh, it's like focusing on the ball and looking somewhere else. Here it's reading the paper. And, and I promise you that if you do the same exercise with the players, the level is different. This guy is under 14. He does this in 15, 16 seconds. In the same group, some does the same exercise in a minute or a minute and a half because they have to focus on their arms. I will just show you another one with the, with the foot. So this time it was with the left foot, you know, and again, it was the same thing, being able to focus your eyes on the wall with the paper and not to look at your feet. Okay, so being able to do something with your foot and to look at somewhere else. So these are the kind of, 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 of exercise we do every day. Here with the colors. So they have, you see, they are reading with the colors. So they, they have to choose a line and you, you will see they have colors and they have to be able to touch. You will see here the colors with their foot, you know, without looking down. So this is the idea to, to, to see in front of you, okay? And we have the same as Javid, you know, to remember the, the numbers, you know. So these are daily games, daily games we do every day uh, on the field, but also before and after the field to improve this capacity to focus and this capacity to read and do something else with your foot or with your arm. And because it's like a game, we mix and, uh, and, and they like it, you know. So maybe this can be a good, a good start to organize a test because you can see that the boys, because they do it every day, they go faster and faster. And maybe the time they do it, maybe can be, I don't know, can be a, a way to measure the improvement of the player on this, uh, in, uh, in this uh, capacity to, to read, the info, to, to, to scan, I would say. So, this is a start. I don't know. He was, he was nodding with a. He was looking at that. Javid, I mean, what were your what are your thoughts in terms of those and those sort of tests and and and, and what they give to the players? Um, in one aspect, they are useful, and that's what we call cognitive warm up, basically uh, yeah. equal to their physical warm up. In yes. terms of transfer to the pitch and transfer to the skill of the uh, ball, uh, it's not going to work for a simple reason. These tests are designed for Formula 1 and I have been working with Formula 1 back in 2014. There you have a closed task. Running a dri running, driving a car is a closed task in comparison with uh, football and execution of a shooting the ball. So it's not going to be transferred to that specific skill. It's a good cognitive warm-up. Just, Javid, just to, just to let you know, I'm working with a sports psychologist because this is what is... Uh, he is working with the boys and now we are thinking about the same kind of exercises on the field fantastic in, on the field but now I, I just showed you this because they did it during the covid period but yeah, when we come back in august we will try to think about this I mean, if i show you a number two may, maybe you have to play a long ball maybe have, we are thinking about this and i hope maybe steve uh, we can i can show you some videos uh, next time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Absolutely, absolutely. Would uh, give um, Javid the final word then on on testing. Um, it was at the end of your presentation. Yep. How how do how do we measure this? Are we able to measure scanning specifically, or even able sort of as a sort of as you see it as a as part of an overall sort of skill of situational awareness? Sure. So two uh, test is possible, and it has been proven to be. Uh, object, objectively working. One is to measure and profile the cognitive profile of the individuals to know how they progress by uh, getting uh, from age nine to age 23. That's simple to do. And the benefit is to understand it is equal to your uh, physical maturity and what many use the physical data for the uh, playing positioning. In terms of testing game understanding and game intuition and uh, situational awareness, uh, the only method that I've been uh, witnessing that it was working in the sports science literature is when you use 2D animation, not video, 2D animation to understand a tactical point of view. And you ask the players about, can you tell me what formation team A or team B is playing? Or can you tell me where the ball is going to as an anticipation task? Or can you tell me what is the best attacking scenario for this specific position for a decision-making task? 
and you can measure accuracy and response time to understand who is doing this in a perfect, uh, accurate and fast manner. So having those verbal tests, they have a fair correlation to what coaches would be seeing on the pitch? Uh, I don't think uh, talking is going to be translated to the pitch because uh, the amount of information you communicate with uh, talking on the pitch is minimal. Um, yeah, but I was meaning in turn, I'm, I'm presuming that these tests you're talking about, that the players are giving you verbal answers or... The problem with verbal answers is if you ask the kid, why did you do that? Or what, what would you do? They will try to come up with the answer that you like to hear. But if you let them to play on a kind of video based on a tablet and tell them you choose what is the best option, they're not really worried about the outcome of the decision. They come up with a real answer. That, that's why, Javid, that's why uh, questioning is not, is not so easy. Yeah. Because as a coach, you, we, 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 we tell to the coaches in coaching courses, please not question the player and do not give the answers. Yeah. But the problem is that sometimes the way you question the player, in fact, implies an answer. Exactly. So that's that means when you ask a question to a player, you must think about it. Because if you tell the player, why didn't you play this? It means you should have played there. <laughs> play. So, so the, the, the way you question the player is, is, is also a work you have to do as a coach. Yeah. Because, of course, you can sometimes in, imply an answer and, and, and the player will maybe answer because he understood through the question that he shouldn't have played there or he should have played there. You know? So, so uh, I think that questioning is, is a good tool but it has to be thought, I would say, before, uh, before the sessions. I agree. Okay, fellas, so I'm gonna have to wrap it up there. I mean, it seems like this conversation, this is very much uh, part one. I think we've uh, got nowhere near to the end of, uh, or even close to sort of discussing some of the things we, we would, would like to discuss on this subject. And we still have questions coming in, so ideally, um, Maybe, yeah, we can get you both back sometime very soon. Thank you, Steve. There is one, one thing is sure, I, I, and, and I think we agree with Javi because we spoke about this before the broadcast. One thing is sure, as a coach, we have to think about this capacity to develop perception scanning and situation awareness. That's for sure. Sure. Absolutely. Mikhail, Javi, thanks a lot for this evening. Thank Thanks for having us. Pleasure. And for everyone out there who's uh, joined us tonight and, and sort of participated with their questions, yeah, a big thank you to you. And hopefully I'll see you all again next week on the Sunday session. Great. See you then. Thank you, Stephen.